you have your Bibles, open with me to Genesis chapter 37. And once you find that, I need you to flip all the way to Philippians chapter 1 and just hold that marker. We're going to work our way through the Bible from Genesis 37 to Philippians chapter 1. Are you with me? Some of you are like, I don't like this guy. He's going to read a lot. Trust me, I got like dyslexia. I'm not going to read a lot. If I read a lot, I'd be like, and the Lord, and it is not good for you, and it is embarrassing for me. But we're going to cover a lot of scripture today. The title of my message is one that I'll tell you it's not what you're going to want to hear, but I do believe it's what you need to hear. The, the, the title of my message is, is something that you don't want to hear from the guy fixing your car when you bring it into the shop. The title of my message is, is not what you want to hear when somebody is fixing your computer. The title of my message is not what you want to hear when, you ju- when your water just broke and you're about to go give birth. Like You do not want to hear the title of this message. But yet I do believe it's what needs to be preached from pulpits. I do believe that, that if we could dissect truths and, and stop being afraid of the truth. and uh, See, we, we, we've heard it said that the truth will set you free. That's true but incomplete. It's if you know the truth, the truth will set you free. Meaning that we've got to learn to apply the truth as our truth and it will then set us free. Because how many people know it's one thing to be set free, it's a whole other thing to walk in freedom. And so, and so the reality that we need to understand is that through the process of what God is doing, we need to understand that. Like, I wish I could just tell people this, the title of my message, like in the baptism pool. Like, like when they're all excited, they're like toweling off. They just went down in the water. They're excited. They're ready to take on the world. I wish I could just say the title of my message to them. I wish I could say the title of my message to the addict that that just surrendered their life to Jesus and they're ready to give their testimony and they're attending Celebrate Recovery and they're doing all this stuff and I just, I wish I could say this. I, I wish I could say it to the person that's been praying for that relationship that's been broken for a really long time. Wondering, is it ever going to be reconciled? Is God ever going to do the thing that I'm praying for? See, I wish that I could just tell them the title of my sermon. Are you ready for the title of my sermon? The title of my sermon is, This May Take a While. So, so turn to three people and say, This May Take a While. Tell somebody else, tell somebody else, his sermons usually do. This may take a while. I, I want, somebody just got that joke, all right. But what I want to talk to you about today is dealing with disappointment. What do you do with, with that dream, with that vision, with that idea, with that purpose, with that God-given destiny that is on the inside of you? What do you do with it when, when you're in the middle of the process that doesn't look like what you thought? What do you do with with the fact that holding on seems harder than just letting go, but you know that if you let go, you're missing out on everything he has for you. What do you do when, when, when you receive a promise on one end of your life and you're believing in that promise and you know that between promise and payoff, there's this dreaded word called process. What do you do in the process? See, it's, it's the process. Christine Kane says it like this. It's what you do in the meantime that will determine the duration of your appointed time. And so what you need to understand is that it's in the process that we learn to be cultivated. See, Jesus did not say, I am the vending machine. Come and put your money and get whatever you want. He did not say, I am your on-demand God. And as long as you press the right button and say the right prayer and do the right works, you will get it. You know, that's not what he said. He says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Apart from me, you can't do anything. Remain in me. See, it, it, it's not such a, fun, such a fun message because Jesus goes on to say in John chapter 15 that, listen, the, the branches that are producing fruit, they're going to be pruned. But those that are not producing fruit, they're going to be cut off. And so what I don't like about that is that whether you're producing fruit or not, there's some cutting involved. But the reality is, is which which end are you getting cut from? Are you getting cut from the source? Are you getting cut at the end that will produce more growth? This may take a while. See, some of you were on your way to the promise. You were on the way to the payoff. You were on your way to everything you were believing God had for you. But in, in the midst of the journey, 
a storm hit you and blindsided you. In fact, it happened to Jesus and the disciples, did it not? Jesus says, let us get in the boat and let us go to the other side. And, and on their way to the other side, the disciples and everybody with Jesus, they were blindsided by one of the biggest storms in the New Testament. Scripture says, very detailed, that Jesus is asleep on a pillow. And the, and the disciples turn to him in the midst of the chaos, and they're, and they're saying, Jesus, don't you care we're about to die? Because I, I think that's the, what the world is asking. They're not asking, what is your theology? Do you believe in predestination or free will? They're asking, do you care that we're going to die? And what we forget is that it was Jesus' idea to go to the other side. And so the church for too long has, says, has said, listen, the, 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 if Jesus is in your boat, you'll never go through storms. And that's a lie. Jesus was in the boat. It was his idea. And they went through the biggest storm. So what do you do when you're there in that storm, in the middle of it? See, I, I, I realize that, that, that when you're in the storm, expecting the payoff, believing in the promise, you can't, you can't be ready for what you didn't see coming. See, I love, I love mixed martial arts and, and, and UFC and, and Bellator. I don't care which one it is. I'm watching it, and you can pray for me later. But if you have any problems with me liking mixed martial arts, you can email me at devinfry at connectchurch.cc. Is that where it is? But, but what fighters say all the time is the ones that hurt the most are the ones you didn't see coming. And so for so many of us, we've been living life wondering what now, how, where, what, and, and something hits us. And because we did not see it coming, it knocks us down. But I came to tell somebody on December 7th of 2018, at the last 508 of this year, that it may have knocked you down, but it did not knock you out. Yeah. That your best is yet ahead. See, I realize that you can never be ready for what you didn't see coming. And there are some of you in here today that life has been going awesome. Everything is great. Some of you, you know what I'm talking about. But others of you, your life is awesome. Your kids always obey you. Your car always starts on time. Your dog always goes to the bathroom outside. And we are glad that you are here. But I'd also be willing to bet that there are some of you in the midst of a situation at the center of a circumstance, and, and you feel like you've been knocked down because you did not see it coming. What do you do when you're in the midst of that? See, because you did not find yourself knowing what was coming, because you were hit with something you could not see, you end up realizing that there's, there's this place that you find yourself in now, a place of insecurity, a place of doubt, a place of fear, a place of disappointment, a place of discouragement, wondering, what now, God? See, if that's you today, I, I'm glad that you're here. And what I believe is that you are not here on accident. That God set up an appointment for you to hear everything you needed to hear for you to get to everywhere he wants you to go. See, what I like to do, if it's okay, I like to read a little bit. I like to talk a little bit. I like to read a little bit. I like to talk a little bit. Is that okay? Genesis chapter 37, verse 2 says this. This is the account of Jacob's family line. I told you I was dyslexic. <laughs> Moving on, don't distract me. <laughs> Joseph, a young man of 17, I've got to pause right there. Do you remember what it was like when you were 17? Do you remember all the great decisions that you made and how every decision you made led to the best things and where your life is right now because of all the awesome things you did at 17? How many of you, that is you here tonight? That's because you are 17 and you have no idea what is ahead. <laughs> Because I didn't, I didn't make good decisions at 17. I was making decisions hoping, hoping that my parents and that the Lord wasn't watching. In fact, my mama's in the house. Can y'all just wave at my mama? Jake was tending the flock with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilphah, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. See, the first thing that we learn about Joseph is that Joseph is a, a young guy that's not always making great decisions, but the worst thing that we learn about Joseph is that he is a tattletale. Ain't nobody like a tattletale. Anybody in here have a brother or sister that was a tattletale? Listen, 
I, I feel your pain. My brother is six years younger than me, and I will tell you, he was a tattletale. He was a hashtag tattletale. But, but the worst of it was, was I think he learned it from my dad, though. There's this one time that I, I had gotten in trouble and I got spanked and it was my mom and this is awkward because she's here. But, but the truth about it is, is I got in trouble and I, I wanted to prove to my dad that I was tough. And I was like, Dad, it didn't even hurt. And he goes, babe, he said it didn't hurt. So that day I got a two for one deal. But no one likes, no one likes a tattletale. Not only was Joseph a tattletale, but we're about to learn that Jacob, uh, Joseph was the favorite. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than any of the other sons because he had been born to him in his old age, and he made an ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of the other one, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. See, if you grew up in church, if you got a Bible background, this is the coat of many colors. See, it's like, it's like Jacob, Israel got, got all the kids into the family camel because they didn't have a van. And so he takes them to, to TJ Maxx and leaves half the kids there, but takes Joseph over to Neiman Marcus and is like, pick whatever you want, my son. <laughs> so Joseph is strutting in his Neiman Marcus coat and all the other brothers are like, what about me? I've been, I've been, I, I got back to school shopping to do and they, and they all got hand-me-downs, but Joseph got the good stuff. Somebody say good stuff. We realize that now he's strutting this, but, but Joseph is the kind of guy that he just doesn't get the hint because why? We're going to give him a little grace, a little slack. He's only 17 years old. Scripture says in verse 5 that Joseph had a dream. See, I, I, think, I think I've got to pause right there and just say that I believe God still speaks through dreams. I believe God is willing to speak to you. I believe that if you've got your mind open and your ears open and your heart receptive to all that he wants for you, I do believe that he can still speak to you. See, my wife, my wife is pregnant, and early on, my wife was gifted a book. The book was written in 1984, and if you have had a child or if you aspire to have a child at one point as a woman, you will be given this book. But men, I had no idea it existed. I had heard about a movie, but I did not know about the book. And the title of the book is What to Expect When You Are Expecting. See, see, in the book, it tells you that at three months, you're going to feel this pain. At, at six months, you're going to feel that pain. And I had no idea what they should write is a book for men that says what to expect when she's expecting. Because I had no idea what I was walking into. I did not know about the late night car rides to get desserts and cookies and ice cream. And she says that she had no cravings. And if she says that to you, I'm going to tell you right now, she is lying. Because just a couple nights ago, I had to go out and buy cookies for her. No, you don't have to. That no, you don't have to means you got to go. <laughs> the problem is, is that not only does she eat them, I eat them too. I've been praying, I've been praying for, for the weight to fall off, but the calories ain't burning because my wife keeps giving them to me. But see, when, when you're... What they've never written and what I've searched throughout scripture and when, when I'm dealing with the promise and the process and the payoff, I, I, I began to ask myself what, what to expect when you, there's no book written about what to expect when you're pregnant with a dream though. See, I wish somebody had told me that when I got a dream at 15 years old, when God spoke to me again when I was 20 years old, I wish that somebody had told me that what I should have expected while we were expecting was some pain. That when you first get pregnant, there's some morning sickness. There's some nausea. There's some things that you used to like, that you used to enjoy looking at. That There was some food. There were some things that was appetizing, appealing. But because of the call, because of the dream, because of the thing, that thing you could no longer hold on to because, because it, it just makes you sick now. I wish that they told me that what I could expect while I was expecting is some discomfort. That as the dream begins to grow, there are some things that used to fit that no longer fit anymore. The old mold, the old model, it can't work anymore because I've been given something new. I wish that somebody told me that I could expect some pressure. Because the more pressure you feel, the closer you are to giving birth to that dream. The more pressure you have, the more pressure you feel, the closer you are. See, see, the bigger the baby gets in the belly, the bigger the dream gets, the organs begin to shift. But the baby's getting ready. 
that dream is getting ready to be birthed. And, and I wish someone told me that that pressure, that pressure may be something that I was not willing to endure, but I, oh, oh, I needed to learn that it was in the pressure that diamonds were formed. It's only under pressure that we find that he is our deliverer. It's only under pressure that we can shine bright like a diamond. I wish someone had told me what to expect while I was expecting. But let me pause here and say this, that I believe God can still speak and God is speaking to us today. There are some people in here that God has put a dream, has put a, a vision in your heart, a purpose. But let me tell you, a vision is not just what you see in front of you. A vision is what you are able to close your eyes and still see. A vision is, see, in the church, we get a bunch of daydreams and think they are visions. See, what is a daydream? A daydream is the thing that you see the need and you, and you know that it's there. And you're the one that raises your hand and says, we should do this. No, you should do this. See, the, the difference between a daydream and a vision is the daydreamer talks about it. The daydreamer points it out but never does anything about it. The person that has received a vision can't stop doing anything about it. And, and when, we, when we understand that, that those that see a need and talk about a need and never do anything about a need, they're not visionaries, they're critics. And ain't nobody got time for a critic. What is it that God has shown you, but you've chosen and you've gotten comfortable just sitting on what you see? See, I'm going to tell you this, that, that what God wants to do to you, that dream that he has put inside of you, that, that idea, that purpose, I, I know that you were on your way. You were moving towards what that looked like. You knew that God gave you this dream and you were on your way to it, but you were blindsided by a storm. When he told his brothers about the dream, they hated him all the more. This is a bonus point. This is not really in the sermon, but it is for somebody. Be careful who you tell your dreams to. Because some people are going to hate you based on what God put in you. And, and if you were expecting that everything God put in you, everybody around you was going to like you, then you would never do anything good for God. See, they hated him all the more. There are some people who will hate you because of the dream that God has put in you. See, one of the most unrealistic things that we can expect from anyone is that, is that God puts a dream in your heart and that everyone around you is going to appreciate it and like it. I thank God for people like Devin that don't care. Huh? That the dream is there and he keeps moving forward. That people come in and disappoint and say one thing and do another, but he keeps on moving forward. Just keep moving forward. See, I know a little something about people that don't like your dream, that don't like the idea, that wish you would just bandwagon on theirs. It's, in fact, the story of my church. Oh, why don't you do it like this? Why don't we do it like that? And I'll tell you, the ones that speak the loudest never do anything. Visionaries are willing to work when no one's watching. See, care, see fear, fear is this dark room. It's, it's, it's where all our negatives get developed. But character is also a dark room that that's where your character gets developed. See, what, what do you do when no one's watching? What are you doing with what God has given you? Verse 6, he says, Then he said to them, Listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose up and stood upright. And while your sheaves all gathered around mine and bowed to it. This is a great dream. If you're Joseph, his brother said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of the dream that he had spoken. Let, let's cut him some slack. He's 17. He doesn't know. Anybody, anybody in here, you know that person just do, that doesn't know when to quit? Like, somebody came into your mind immediately. And, and if no one came to your mind, you are that person. <laughs> because there's always that person, right? Like, if you, if you were a young cat and your mother turned to you and was like, do it one more time. You are that person. 
right? Like, like do, you, do you, you, you know that person just doesn't know what doesn't get the hint, keeps talking about them, only talks about them? Here's Joseph. He had another dream. And he told his brothers, listen, I said I had another dream. And this time the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars were bowing down to me. At this point, Joseph's a goner. He has no idea what's about to hit him. It's all about to fall apart for him. He goes on and tells his dad, tells his dad this dream. And his dad's like, listen, do you intend to to make something of this? Who do you think you are? So his dad turns to him and says, go get me a report about your brothers. Why? Because he knew that Joseph was a tattletale. So Joseph is on his way to get a report from his brothers. And scripture says that his brothers see him from afar. And scripture says that when they saw him, they intended to harm him. But one brother gets a brilliant idea. He's like, listen, let's not kill him. Let's sell him. Because money always makes everything better. And so they take Joseph, they they sell him off into slavery, they they mangle his clothes, and they cover it with blood because that's what happens when one sin calls upon another. You start with one thing, but then you got to do another thing to hide the thing that you just did. That was just, that was bonus too. See, they wanted to kill him. but They said, no, let's sell him. Anybody in here ever wanted to sell your brother or sister? No, don't raise your hand, that's bad, don't do that. It's weird if they're sitting right next to you. (laughs) See, as an outsider looking in, we begin to look at Joseph's situation, and we look at it and say, Joseph had it coming. He's a tattletale. He was the favorite. He's flaunting his coat. He's not staying quiet about his dream. Like, like Like that baby at the restaurant, right? Y'all know the baby I'm talking about. Like, you're trying to have a a romantic time with your girl. You're trying to have a romantic time with your guy. And the baby behind you is like, wah, wah, slap. Forks fly. Drinks fly. And you're like, after like three hours of this, in your mind you're thinking, like, I could do something about this. (laughs) Like, I would like to volunteer my services. (laughs) And and eventually, like, the dad, y'all know the dad I'm talking about. The dad just slides his seat back. Wipes his mouth one time, throws the napkin on the table, takes the kid out. Like, you know what that kid's about to get. (laughs) But everybody is thinking, like, like, he had it coming. I mean, the kid wouldn't be quiet. The kid wouldn't stop acting up. See, the problem with that mentality is, is that we bring that into the church, and we look at somebody's situation. We look at their pain. We look at their discomfort. We look at their pressure, and we, we are led to believe, you know what? It must have been something that they did. When in fact, when in fact the reality is, is is that it is the epitome of arrogance to speak into a situation that we do not know the whole story. See, while we are tempted to judge Joseph, God had him on a journey from the pit to the palace. God had a plan. God had a purpose. God was working something out. See, every season has a struggle that we cannot see. In fact, my father-in-law, first time he, uh, that, that I went down to, to meet with him and to get to know the family, like my, my wife's family is from Kentucky, and they had this farm, and there was like grass everywhere. I mean, like 20-something acres of just grass, right? And, and I walk out there, and I'm like, wow, your grass is beautiful. And he turns to me, he's like, you want to help me mow it tomorrow? I was like, no. <laughs> But I felt pretty stupid because I forgot that for the grass to look that good over that many acreages, it's got to be maintained. There's work that comes with the beauty. So and then my, my father-in-law came up here because they had never seen a whole lot of snow. And so there was one time that he was here, and he's like, wow, the snow is so beautiful falling. I was like, you want to help me shovel it tomorrow? <laughs> because every season has a struggle that if you... If you do not know what the struggle is while you're in it, you'll be ignorant to it. See, we look at other people, what they have. We we forget to look at what it took to get them there. We see the fruit, but we don't see the roots. We see the victory, but not the fight. And so in Genesis 39, the story continues, where Joseph was then taken down to Egypt. Potiphar buys Joseph, and and Potiphar, he's kind of like the leader of the army. He's got some stuff together. He's making some stuff work. And so he he, he is one of Pharaoh's officials. And, And while he's in there, Joseph's story only gets worse. 
Here's something, point number one, for you to remember when you are in the middle of the process, when you are dealing with disappointment. I need you to remember this, that point number one is maybe God's not punishing you but preparing you. It's hard to see, but maybe, just maybe, he wants to take you to another level. Maybe the only way that Ephesians 3.20 becomes your reality is if you are willing to go through the process. Hebrews 10.36 says this, you need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. See, you need to keep fighting. You need to keep going. The only way you receive the promise is to stay perseverant. Persevere through it. So the story doesn't end there. So Potiphar has this wife, and we're going to, for sake of the story, we're going to call her Hotifer. And Hotifer, she was thirsty. Like, for real. And so she looks at Joseph. Scripture says that Joseph was a handsome young man. And so she's like, she she dropped some tone look on him, like, let's do it. And Joseph is like, it's not about to happen. And she's like, no, it is about to happen. He's like, no, it's not. She's like, yes, it is. He's like, no, it's not. And she's like, come here, boy. And so she grabs him. And scripture says that he, he returns fire back to her and says, how could I ever do something like this and sin against my God? See, he, he wasn't saying, how could I do this against my master? How could I do this against my God? See, sometimes... We're in the midst of slavery. We're in the midst of our struggle. We're in the midst of the circumstance. We're in the midst of the situation. And we forget that we should not abandon a God that's never abandoned us. And so so she grabs him. And scripture says that she shakes it. He, He shakes her off and he leaves his clothes behind. It's the first streaker we see in scripture. He's like, we're going, we're going streaking through the quad. The problem is never made it to the quad because she lies to her husband and she's like, listen, this, this guy of yours, this, this servant of yours, he tried to rape me. Because that's, that's what happens, right? See, the church, the church leads us to believe that if you do the right thing, never will bad things happen to you. But Joseph was doing the wrong thing, the right thing, but bad things still kept happening. You need to understand that that he is with you in the process. It's not over until God keeps working it through in you. See, even even though everything he had gone through, he did not turn his back on God. See, here we have Joseph doing the right thing and bad things still happen to him. Like I said in John 15, scripture says that if we, re- if we remain in him, the, 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 the good branches producing fruit, they get pruned, the bad branches get cut. See, what you have to understand is that there, Psalm chapter 1 says this, that if we are planted in good soil, we were produced a harvest in season. See, sometimes for you to produce the right fruit in the right season, you're not getting cut off. You're just getting cut back. And, and when you understand that setbacks to God are just launching pads for his promotion, you'll understand that the thing you're going through now is simply temporary to the place that he wants to take you. I know I am preaching good to somebody today because some of you have felt like you have been in the biggest setback of your life, wondering how long, how much longer. You're wondering, I thought it should have happened like this, but it's looking like this. And you're wondering, God, do you even care? Do I, how long must I keep enduring this? And God is saying this, your disappointment will not end the way you thought because you're not getting cut off. You've been cut back, but in the right season, you will produce the right fruit. Remember that that God is not punishing you. He's preparing you. And so the master got so mad that he, he, he listens to his wife and he throws Joseph in a prison. He goes from a pit to slavery. From that slavery position, now he's in a prison. But the problem is he's not in just any prison. He's in the king's prison. What? What would be the best place? I mean, if you're, let's just say you're going to be put second in command of all of Egypt. Let's just say you've never heard the story or you have, but go with me. If you were going to be placed in that position, second overall, what would be the best place to learn about uh, army strategies and how to run your people? Would it not be in the house of the official of the one who runs it? 
If you're going to be second in command, wouldn't you have to know and learn political talk and how to talk to who and, and the customs and the who's and the where's and the why's? Where would be the best place to do that? Probably in the king's prison. See, what sometimes looks like punishment might just be God preparing. See, maybe all hell is breaking loose in your life, and you've been doing everything right. I came to tell somebody, it's not punishment, it's preparation. See, later on, two guys come into the prison. One is a cupbearer, the other is a baker. I don't know what it would take for a baker to be put in prison. I mean, it must have been really bad bread, but he got thrown in prison. <laughs> We don't know why, but one night they have some dreams, and Joseph's like, I know something about some dreams. Tell me your dream. Why, why so downcast? Tell me what's going on. And so the cupbearer tells him a dream, and he's like, good news, homie. In three days, you're going to get your job back, and everything will be all good. And so the baker sounds like, he's like, this is awesome. Let me tell, let me tell him my dream. And so the baker tells him his dream. He's like, bad news for you. You're going to die. So you don't have to remember me in three days. <laughs> and so what Joseph said happened, but the condition that he put on the cupbearer was, listen, when you get out of this place, when, when the king, when Pharaoh remembers you, don't forget me. One of the most painful scriptures in this entire passage. The chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. See, it's like the scene in Titanic, right? Like Rose is on that door. I, I'll never let go. Listen, there was room for Jack on that door. But Rose, Rose hit too many buffets on that cruise ship a pound a day, they say, a pound a day. So that, I mean, and, and she's like, I'll never let go. And as soon as Jack struggles, she's like, bye. <laughs> Listen, I'm, that, is, that is in the Bible. That's scriptural right there. No, it's not. It's not in there, but it's fact. See, the cupbearer forgot him. And maybe you're here today and you feel forgotten. I came to encourage somebody today that while you're in the process, while dealing with disappointment, while wondering if discouragement will ever set you free, let me tell you this, that you might need to remember that it might not be, it may not be punishment, but preparation. But point number two is that God has not forgotten you. See, promotion does not come from the north, south, east, or west. It comes from the Lord. See, man may forget, but God never does. See, the truth is you have a choice and if you, if you did have the choice, you would have never picked the thing that you're going through right now. You would have never picked it for yourself, but you find yourself there, wondering for how long. It gets worse for Joseph. Genesis 41, verse 1 says, When two full years had passed, Pharaoh had a dream. See, have you, have you ever just come to church like, expectant and you're believing and you are trusting and you're like today is the day that I'm gonna get my breakthrough and nothing today's the day one of the most frustrating things in our journey as believers is seasons that we go through where we feel unfruitful notice how I said feel see feelings are not facts Deceptive is the heart of man. I think there was a preacher recently that preached something like that here. Deceptive is the heart of man. Listen, what you feel is not the facts. But you ever been there? Believing, expecting, trusting, and nothing? You don't believe me? Ask the 28-year-old girl that's been dating the same guy for a long time and still got no ring. All that cardio, all, all that makeup, and nothing. I'm not talking about when you don't plant the seed and expect the blessing. I'm talking about when you are doing it. See, you can't expect to get the aid from a book that you never opened. But I'm talking about when you did plant the seed. 
that time where you're believing and you're tithing and you're trusting and you're serving and you're doing everything, every next step possible that Pastor Derek and Pastor Devin has give, have given you, but somewhere along the lines, you're praying to conceive, you're praying for children and, and nothing. But then that couple, friend of yours, just got married and they get pregnant and they're complaining about the accident that you've been praying for. I'm I'm talking about that that situation where the the man who, the young man, the young woman who graduated in a field is buried in college debt and can't find the job that they went to school for, and so they settle just to pay a bill, but they are miserable. Miserable. But they're doing everything right. God, where, where are you, God? See, sometimes the moments when you feel most unfruitful is when God is preparing you, tilling you, and cultivating your character. So Pastor Devin preaches this awesome sermon, and you're like, I'm going to do this. And then you leave, and then Monday you try, and Tuesday you try, and you're like, Pastor, that didn't work. You're expecting to change 20 years of bad habits in two days? You cheated on your girlfriend, on your wife four times, and you expect her to forgive you in four minutes? You pretend like this is your source, but but the truth is, is, is everything and anything other than this has become what you rely on and expect it to change. Listen, you can't, resolve alone cannot change bad habits that took over years to form. Been addicted for years? Do I believe that God sets us free? Absolutely. But it's our job to to trust in the process. Scripture says in Psalm 84, blessed are those who set their mind on the pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Notice how it says, not blessed are those who arrive in Jerusalem. It's blessed are those that understand it's in the journey to the place that they were going that they get blessed. What do you do? What do you do? See, I came to tell somebody that this may take a while. What do you do in the middle of disappointment? All of this was to tell you these few words. Hold on. Keep going. Between promise and payoff is process. And and when I read Galatians chapter 6, verse 9, it teaches me, not to grow weary in doing good, not to grow weary in doing good, not to grow weary in doing good. Let me, let, me, let me make somebody understand the fullness of this truth. It is not a sin to get weary, but you will not receive what you, what you believed. You will not receive the harvest if you faint. So the, the verse says this, do not grow weary in doing good, for at the right time, you will re- reap a harvest if you faint not. So some of you came here today saying, Pastor, I am sick of starting over. I am sick of starting over. Let me encourage you to say, stop quitting. Keep going. I'm reminded of Joshua fights this battle at Jericho. See, I'm not God, and if I were, I probably would have designed that one differently. That's why I'm not God. But scripture says that, that God gives them a strategy to march around the city. Six days, they march one time every day. See, if it were me, don't judge me, but if it were me, I would have designed this miracle like a Tetris game. Like after every lap, just a chunk of the wall, right? Because because that's what we want to see, right? We want to see that in the middle of the process, we see results. But fruitfulness is a result of faithfulness. Remain faithful and you will see the fruit. Stay connected. Keep trusting. We need to understand that. That it's when we hold on. See, I didn't really want to preach this message. In fact, when, when Pastor Devin asked me, what's the title? What, you want, what do you want to go with? I, I, I never take long with titles, but I took so long with this one. Because I don't like the word while. While is indefinite. How long? A while. In fact, the very next verse of Hebrews chapter 10, 36 says you need to persevere. Verse 37 says this. 
For in just a little while, he is coming. I don't know if I like God's concept of little while. (laughs) In Peter, it says one day is like a thousand years. A thousand years is like a day. So I don't know if I like God's concept of while. You know what I like? I like suddenly. I could preach on suddenly. All of a sudden came a violent rushing wind. Listen, I was in worship today, and with those subwoofers, I felt Acts chapter 2 here. But I, I love suddenly. I don't like while. I was watching this documentary, the story of Pixar. It was good, and I'm, I'm watching it, and all the way at the end, Steve Jobs drops a bomb. He's like, everybody talks about Pixar like it's an overnight success because everything that happened when it happened. But this is what he says. Most overnight success stories are years in the making. See, if you endure your while, you'll experience the suddenly. I was watching an interview with Michael Todd, and he said, listen, everybody's looking at me today, and they're thinking, Pastor Michael Todd, like, like, wh- wh- how did this happen? How did he get here so quickly? And he says, anything that God does that's great has a long runway. See, we need to denounce magic Christianity. So then Pharaoh has a dream. Pharaoh calls in all the magicians, all the interpreters, and he's like, tell me about this dream. And none of them had anything. But the cupbearer, the cupbearer was like, hey, Remember that time you had put me in prison? See, what had happened was, is, is I had had a dream. And, and there was this kid there that interpreted. He's like, bring him here. So Pharaoh's dream is this crazy dream. Cows eating cows, rivers swallowing rivers. It was weird. But he's like, Joseph, can you interpret this? And Joseph says, I cannot, but my God can. See, when everything in life seems overwhelming, when, when everything in your life seems like it is over your head, I came to tell somebody it is still under God's feet. So final point number three. Remember that it's preparation, not punishment. That God has not forgotten you and that God is in control. God uses the pain for your purpose, turns the mess into a message, makes the test a testimony. See, at the beginning of the story, he wasn't ready. But he learned the tactics. He learned the system. See, God was doing something in him before God did something for him. And I came to tell somebody that feels like they are in the middle of their disappointment, before God does something for you, he needs to do something in you. So God, God got him to the payoff, but it was just a different road. So Genesis 42, verse 20 says this. You intended to harm me, so his brothers show up. The dream that he had had many chapters before comes to pass. And he sees them there. He says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good, to accomplish what is now being done. Why? To save many lives. See, let me tell somebody that the thing that you are going through wondering if you're ever going to get out, in fact, it's not even for you. It's for everybody else that's around you that's going through the same thing. So the verse I asked you to open way back in the beginning says, being confident of this very thing, he who has begun a good work in you will complete it to the day of Jesus Christ. You may not be where you need to be, but let me encourage you, you are at least not where you used to be. Every head bowed and every eye closed. I'm going to make two calls today. Call number one is for those that have never surrendered their lives to Jesus. In fact, this is why this church exists. This this church would not be doing what they do if if the heart of this church was not the lost being reconciled. Maybe that's you today and you've never surrendered your life to Jesus. It starts with surrender. See, 
our kingdom is the reverse. See, every other kingdom you win when you keep fighting on your own strength and never give up. See, in our kingdom, when you surrender to his strength, when you find yourself at your weakness, his strength is made perfect. You walked in here wondering, how long, God? And he's saying, just a little while. But it starts with surrender. If that's you today, would you grab the hand of the person sitting next to you? Actually, everybody in here grabbing the hand of the person sitting next to you. If that's you today and you're, and you're wondering, you know, how long? I, I've been kicking the bucket on this Christianity thing for a really long time. How long must I endure? It starts with surrender. If that's you today, will you just squeeze the hand of the person sitting next to you? as a sign of wanting to surrender, of to, to give your, your life to Jesus. See, I believe this church believes what I believe is that no one is called to do this thing alone. We are stronger together. And so if you did this, if, if somebody next to you squeezed your hand because we are stronger together, will, will you as a symbol of their surrender, will you just raise their hand for them? Amen, you can bring your hands down. Hands all over the room. Before I pray, look at me for a second. When I was a kid, I, I was really cute as a kid, and so I was always in Brazilian weddings. <laughs> and, there, and there was this one time that they sent me off to a wedding. And, and I walked into the room where all the brides, where the bride and the bridesmaids were changing. And I walk in and I was like, ah! And she screamed and I screamed. But later on, I got in trouble for what, what had happened. And I couldn't understand it. Why, why am I getting in trouble? I was a kid, I was bored, and I'm at a wedding. Why did this happen? And then only years later did I realize that no one likes to be seen while they're changing. And so you raised your hand today. And you're worried, what is this going to look like? I'm uncomfortable. No one walks into TJ Maxx or Marshalls and picks up the pants that they like and they're just like, right here. <laughs> no one does that. But this journey that we're on following Jesus, I'm going to tell you, the most beautiful thing is to see change happening right in front of you. Second call. Second call. I went to a hotel. They go, they send me up to my room. I got to the room and I put the key in there and it's like, eh, eh. and so what guys do is when things aren't working, we try harder. It's like 11 o'clock at night. We arrived late. And, and in that moment, I, I walk downstairs. I'm mad at the attendant. Throw the key on the counter. It doesn't work. Sir, what room are you in? I'm in room 203. No, sir, you're in room 302. <laughs> I just felt bad for the, me banging on the door, trying to open it up at like 11 o'clock at night. But, but that's what so many of us do. We send all sorts of energy, all sorts of passion, all sorts of anger, holding a key to the wrong door. Religion is the wrong door. Jesus is the key to the door that you need to get in. And if you find yourself in the middle of that disappointment, if you find yourself in the middle of that disappointment, needing somebody to pray with you. Will you just stand with me? If you're wondering, how long do I have to go through this? You're wondering, God, I can't see the end in sight. If you've been praying, wondering, I can't deal with this disappointment anymore, will you just stand?